welcome everybody to our next Hangout. Um, there's been some good discussion going on in the list in between the last two calls, uh, which has been really good to see. Um, so today um, we've got uh, two topics that we're going to cover. Um, so I wanted to spend uh, the first part of the session uh, talking about um, uh, disability support uh, when describing opportunities um, to carry on some of the discussions we've, uh, uh, we've had on the list and in some of the previous calls, uh, and then take a first look at the, the work that's been happening around developing a shared activity list. Um, as ever, if there's uh, other, other topics you want to bring up, then, um, then let me know, and we'll uh, try and cover those uh, at the end of the session. Um, so I've, uh, I'm going to share some slides just to kind of uh, help frame the discussion. Uh, share the screen. Okay, so um, so as I mentioned, we've we've had a bit of a discussion around um, uh, how best to kind of frame uh, disability support um, available for uh, opportunities. Um, Jade shared some of the uh, fields, um, ways that they capture it uh, in their system, uh, and there's been good good exchange of uh, information on the mailing list so far. Um, so what struck me. Uh, uh, from the the feedback we've had so far is that there's there's a there's a couple of different viewpoints which I thought it might be worth just kind of recapping um, so uh, one aspect here is um, how users describe their own disabilities um, so this is the kind of information that the active life survey was uh, capturing so it's answering questions such as you know, does this uh, does it your disability or illness affect you in any of the following areas so that's one type of information. Um, the second is suitability of, of specific individual sports for specific impairments that people might have. Um, so the examples there are the, the quite detailed classifications that uh, are in the Deloitte uh, Parasport and the Paralympic uh, classifications that people have um, pointed at uh, from the list. Uh, and then the, the third category is the what support is available uh, at a specific event. So, uh, you know, what disabilities conditions can this activity accommodate? Um, now, I think it's useful to, to look across those three areas, but I think um, my feeling is that we, for this activity, we're concentrating on the third one. So focusing on, um, on the opportunities rather than classifying sports uh, in particular. I think if there's a need to do that, then it's something that could be looked at in the context of annotating um, the, the activity list, for example. Um, but th I wanted to kind of share that and see if you had any, any thoughts on, on that, just, but just make sure that we're kind of all talking about the same kind of, um, same kind of direction. Um, so uh, I've, based on the feedback and examples that people have posted to the list, I've pulled together just a spreadsheet that just shows how they line up um, uh, and it's pretty obvious from what people were saying that there's already a, co a core common set of uh, uh, fields that people are using in systems. And so it seems to me like that's, that's just a good basis to, to draw on for um, the standard we're developing. But there are a number of variations around um, what's, I think, mainly around some of the f uh, physical impairments and wheelchair accessibility and users. Um, I'm going to switch over to spreadsheet so we can take a look at it. Uh, just bear with me. Um, can you see, I'm not sure if that shares work properly. Can you see a spreadsheet? Yeah. Yep, okay. Um, so all I've done here is just uh, pull together all of the, the, uh, the various fields that people were saying they were using on the list. Um, so our, the first column here, we've got uh, what's in uh, Get Active, what's in Open Sessions, um, GLL, Sports Suite, Cloud Live, all using the same uh, basic uh, lists. Uh, although Raymond kind of gave me also another example just to illustrate some of the variations that 
um, Cloudy Live have amongst their users. Um, I looked at the fields of data provided, EMD, again, that's very similar. Um, and there's a few different variations across Gloucestershire, Active Dev, and Active Essex. Um, that's, it's these areas where I think there's a few more uh, variations, but you can see um, everyone is uh, using the same six or seven. Um, so um, hearing impairment, learning impairment, mental health condition, physical impairment, visual impairment, uh, multiple impairment is, is a common one as well. Uh, and then a kind of uh, catch-all other category. Um, so that seems like a kind of a, a good list to, to build on for, for describing opportunities. Um, a couple of the a couple of the systems have an extra descriptive field or um, invite uh, participants to uh, contact the organizer. Um, so open sessions invite somebody to contact. Uh, I think EMD uh, had a, a, a specific field for additional information on disabilities conditions catered for. Um, so there is some extra variation. Um, uh, I think Raymond pointed out there was at least some of their customers are capturing things like uh, uh, movement disabilities, sensory impairments, um, kind of illness. Um, the other variations are around uh, uh, low and upper limb impairments and kind of wheelchair users. But I just thought I'd just kind of recap that. Um, so based on that, my suggestion was going to be um, go on to slides. Um, that we uh, make a couple of revisions to the existing specifications. Um, so the first is that we'll add a disability support property that can have um, some specified standardized values. And those would be the seven that I just read out um, that are common across the majority of systems. Um, we also add a property similar to what EMD have to capture uh, additional disability information, so just some contextual information for our participants, and that follows the pattern that we, I think we're going to be adopting with having a general description field and then separate fields for, for more specific targeted information. Um, and then I was thinking that we've revised the primer to include some more detailed examples of uh, using uh, those new fields uh, and also include some recommendations such as um, the importance of providing a contact point um, for um, for people with disabilities, which is I think something that Nick uh, mentioned uh, in his feedback from Sport England. Um, so that's a kind of a summary and proposal. Um, I just wanted to open that out now and just see what what people think. Does that seem uh, a reasonable summation of where we're at? Is there anything that we think anything else that you think needs to go in there? Um, Lee, can, it's Carol here from Sports England. Hi. Hi. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, the first thing I wanted to ask was just in terms of those categories, is that for the sort of cus customer interface or is that for the sort of leisure provider to have um, specific categories so that they can collect data and they can sort of um, assign different activities to those impairments? Um. I think it's a it's a bit of both. I mean, I, I think um, the the fields I think so far have been what people are, are, are kind of what information is being collected when an, an event or session is being set up um, by the provider side. But I've seen that those same fields are, are presented to participants. So, like the you know active dev and active Essex, I can look at those and filter on them in some, in some um, cases. Because I think the first thing is there's obviously sort of commonalities across a lot of those um, bits of data that have been collected, which is great. But actually, we're just seeing a lot more variance in how people describe their disability. Um, so things like long-term pain, um, you know, a large proportion of disabled people um, have long-term pain, which inhibit their ability to. 
um, do big activities and might affect their ability to participate. Um, so that would be one thing that I'd, I'd sort of probably include in there, um, which might sort of, you know, probably lead to maybe a more physical impairment, but it's just certainly something that we know affects a lot of disabled people. I think the other thing that's um, that sort of come through from our insight is just around multiple impairments. So um, I'm just sort of nervous about sort of the use of the categorisation um, because there'll be people who have, you know, over 70% of disabled people have more than one impairment. So it's not quite as simple as categorising um, by individual impairment. Um, and again, it's just how that information is then going to be used to be able to then um, signpost or navigate somebody to a particular sports activity based on that. Has that been considered? Um, well, the, the point about multiple impairments, I think, is uh, is interesting because I wasn't quite sure what what that meant um, as a as an option for users. Whether it was it's intended to be, we have support for people with multiple impairments, or whether it was just a catch-all, we have support for multiple impairments at this event. So, right. So, too much in by the distinction. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I think the the key thing from a from a sort of consumer point of view, and this is where I'm, I'm coming from, sort of based on on what we know about disabled people. First of all, a lot of disabled people may not um, identify with their disability when they're looking for sort of sport and physical activity. So that would be one one thing is just how the information is used and if it's um, it's not going to exclude those people who don't identify with having a, a disability. Um, and then I think there's just something around if they're looking for a particular sporting opportunity, is it in specific to their impairment? Or are they just looking for a sporting opportunity that they can um, just do and it can be adapted for their needs? And I don't know whether by categorising it that people will get to be... Um, to the experience they're looking for, which is just an inclusive experience. This is a point that Ben okay. raised as well. So example, uh, on the... If you were looking at somebody who has a, a visual impairment and they're looking for a specific um, sport that caters for that, so something like golf ball, then that makes sense. But if they're looking to do swimming, would they then put in that they've got a visual impairment and would then swimming come up as an opportunity? Uh, ben raised the same point around, uh, he, and just in his absence, he's given me a little note here. Um, he wanted to, to be clear that um, the way that people search for activities should be our guide in, in, in defining this, um, because they, they may not associate with some of those impairments, but they might still um, require that support. I think this is, is that kind of similar to what you're, you're saying, Carol? Yeah, sorry, thank you. Yes, it, yeah, definitely. Uh, I think it's about how somebody interprets their own impairment and then what, what they want to do and then what they know that they can do. So ben, that's where it can, it can be a challenge. So, so Ben's suggestion was that, um, that well, let me just get this up. So um, that if, um, if the leader of the session thought that they were able to, um, that the session was appropriate for a particular type, type of impairment, then that might be useful to inform the, the search side of things. Um, but also that some, a lot of leaders of sessions aren't really well educated in terms of understanding what that means to support a particular impairment, um, you know. And so the, the, um, the, in previously, um, we had this conversation with um, EFDS, or EDF, EDFS, um, they talked about the idea of creating a kind of questionnaire or something that you would be able to fill in to say, actually, could I handle visual impairment in my session? Do I know what that means? Um, depending on the type of, of sport, basically implying it's quite complex to figure out whether I can tick the box or not. Um, and so we need to provide adequate guidance um, that this isn't just a case of putting some boxes into some form that people can tick, uh, but there's something ar ar around that. Um, as well.
just another little point on that. Um, if we are going to look at this from the point of view as to how people search for activities, we then all also need to settle on uh, what the definition of a activity without any of this data included in it actually means. So if I have a sport uh, on, the, you know, on the list where we haven't put any of these fields in place, does that mean that that sport automatically by default is freely available to anybody or does it then mean that anybody that, um, because if we don't clarify that up front, then the, um, then the process of publishing your data, yes, I know we, we would like to look at this from the searching perspective, but you also need to think about it from the other side, um, where uh, if you are saying that people have to classify all of, their, all of their data with these fields before they can publish it, uh, then that would just be another hurdle that we're adding in. Um, so, yeah, we need to balance it out my personal take would be if the fields are not there, then uh, we, we should assume that that sport is freely available to all. And then flip it on its head in effect where um, if, if the fields are specified, then uh, it's, it, it narrows it down specifically to, to those categories. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Um, just, sorry, Kim. Um, yeah, no, we were just going to add to that. I don't know if it helps or, or, or not, but on ours, um, basically anyone can add obviously what they like, but the, um, the title of that particular section is inclusive of members with, and then it has the, the different options. So then you'd say it's inclusive of members with hearing impairments or visual impairments or learning disabilities. So basically it would then, um, it's not saying it's solely for those with hearing impairments, it's inclusive of. So I think it's, it's that way around. So then it will still come up in all searches. And then basically if somebody is actually running a session that is solely inclusive of, or, or only for, sorry, people with a hearing impairment, it tends to be specified in the writing and the title um, more so than, I, than we just leave it with the inclusive. I don't know if that helps or, or hinders the conversation a bit more, but that's how we've managed to get around it and it's worked thus far. Um, hi, Kim. Um, I um, agree with that. We, we do the same. Um, we have um, the, the five or six categories and the, the leader of, of that session um, declares whether they um, whether that session is or they're happy to cater for um, those different groups within that session and um, if it was just for one of those groups as you say they put it in the um, in the description or in the cloud then great yeah same as us yeah yeah okay I mean that, that makes sense to me um, I'm, I'm not sure I fully understand um, uh, Cal's feedback though. So, it, uh, I'm, well, I'm not sure. Is is are you saying that the the kind of set the six seven categories that people are already using are not sufficient, um, or that they just need to think about how those are presented? Um, I think that there could be additional ones in there, um, but I but I'm just thinking back to. Um, so I don't know your first name, but I can see um, Bourbon, the Bourbon on there, on the on the picture. Hi, um, is is almost having um, you know an opportunity that means that it doesn't matter whether you tick a box about your impairment, you just know that you can turn up and it will cater for you. Um, and then that point around actually then an activity that will be inclusive for people of particular impairment types, and then something that is specific for specific impairments. So it's almost like three, three different I'm really sorry, but I can't hear Carol speaking. Oh, I'm, I'm really sorry, I'm at a train station, so um, it's just, can you hear me better now? Yeah, maybe talk close to the microphone, that might help. Yeah, hold on. Is that better? Much better. Okay. Okay. Right. Um, yeah. So I think I think there does need to be a, a, just a bit more work on those categories, um, just so that we can just make sure that you know anybody who who is logging on feels that they can identify with those sort of individual categories. As I say, we've got twelve now that we use with Active Lives, 
um, which um, you can people can identify with. Um, so there'll be stuff in there for sort of behavioural um, memory, so cognition and that. Um, that. So I think we could do some work around the different categories, but I think the point around um, making the opportunities so that they're inclusive for people with all sorts of categories is going to mean that people aren't going to be identifying their impairment to a particular sport. And I think that's that point around if it isn't impairment specific and it caters for everybody, then do you need to put a category to it? Uh, this might be my naivety, Carol, but are there some sports that just... I think in reflection of that, it will also mean that people who have multiple impairments aren't going to be then defined by one or the other. Um, Carol, Carol are, there, are there some sports where um, you just can't do it if you have a certain impairment? Do you see what I mean? Like, is this... Is it, sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch that. Are there, are there two levels here? Because I feel like there might be some sports where a particular impairment, it, you just can't do that sport. Um, you know, so if, you, if you're in a wheelchair, for example, you might, you just can't do basketball, but you can do wheelchair basketball. Um, so, so is there a um, is there a case for certain activities being almost ruled out for particular impairment groups? But then, in some sessions, it sounds like there might be a swimming session that caters for those who have visual impairment. But maybe it depends on how the session is run. So, it, you know, so some some sessions can be coached so that they can. Um, be inclusive of, as you said, uh, as, as Kim suggested, X or Y. Um, oh, can you hear me? Not very well. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, I, I can. Um, yeah, I mean, it's going to be dependent on the person and the level of the um, impairment they have. So somebody might have visual impairment, but it might be partially sighted. Um, and some people might classify as a visual impairment, but be completely blind. And that's obviously then going to impact, um, you know, how they access sport and, and what support they need. So, um, and obviously there'll be some sports where there can be equipment that can be adapted so that it will cater for people with um, particular physical impairments. So I think it's about the um, deliverer of those sessions being really clear on what they can cater for and what they can't cater for. And I think, again, that comes back to a point that was made earlier about the, um, the people leading those sessions and also what, what's on offer and, and whether that can be adapted. It almost sounds like there's a complicated case here where you've got a mapping of sport to what can be adapted and not adapted uh, so that you can then decide, you know, is it, I, I don't know the examples, but you know, is, there, is, is it that yoga can be adapted for wheelchair uh, users? No. <laughs> Jade's like, don't even do that. It's a really silly idea. I think, um, I think Nick, I was going to say, Nick, I think the problem here, the problem here is we could get into a, very um, complex kind of matrix of, of stuff here and what we what is coming clear out of this is that we need to provide some very clear guidance around how this should be even if we come back to the, the core categories around it yes we, we, we can get to that but very clear guidance about how this is a held in systems and b then presented good practice guidance back to the consumer and, and not making any assumptions and, and the, the, the fail safe stuff is only having that contact number or whatever person to contact about that course to find further information because the other issue as Carol's mentioned you know the, the other there's a cross link here to site equipment and what is there so if you you know if you have a particular disability you may not need help but you might need to know there's a low slope to get into the swimming pool or there's a hoist or something like that that's easy to access so I, I kind of feel that we need to kind of do some sort of a, a kind of a, a guide that just sits around this kind of stuff to help people. Yeah, I mean that that makes sense. And the, the this distinction between you know whether sport individual sports are suitable or can be adapted, and what support a coach can provide is the is the different categories that I was, I was trying to present at the start. Um, and it felt like because there was already a reasonable convergence across different platforms for what coach support at events, that that's where we should start because you know, there's already six or seven terms that people are using. Um, uh, yeah, but Ben's, uh, Ben's point on that was that those terms 
um, have we actually tested them with users? Because his, his, what he would hypothesize is that those terms aren't sufficient and are actually probably not very useful for, for the users. The fact that we have convergence uh, doesn't necessarily mean that that's the answer. It might just be we've converged on a, on a local optima rather than the global optima. Um, well, I can add in that that we've used them as Leicestershire and Rutland Sport. They're the terms that we use for all of our programs. Um, and then we provide our reporting on that. It has worked across the 23 different CSPs that currently use our system as well. So when they do their reporting, they use those terms. Um, it's just for us, I mean, you, kind of like how Nick also said, you could keep going here. You could have loads and loads of classifications for everything. Um, if we're talking about from a user's point of view, I don't think it should just be the person that's searching. You also need to think about the person that's adding the opportunities. And if we end up having lists and lists and lists of options, things to choose from, it could actually become a barrier to people wanting to put their opportunities on there if they've got to then know the definition of every single one. And, and then under each of those ones, which ones they can provide equipment for, can't provide equipment for, what they have experienced, of um, etc um, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying we need to make it really generalized and I do know we need to help those people but at the same time I think that at some point we need to draw a bit of a line in the sand just to get us going and then maybe look at revisions on, on follow-up phases or something along those lines um, um, for now in my opinion and, and again admittedly you guys might disagree the, the options that we have there those sort of six or seven that we just saw on the list I do think would actually actually sort of tick the box to get us going at least in the first instance and then look at developing further later if required but that's just my personal opinion has everyone um, seen the comment that ray just made a comment in the box uh, that's what i was going to say so i go on me <laughs> yeah go gonna, ahead um, i was going to add in um i'm I'm not an expert in this area, but from the conversations um, we've had with Interactive, um, is that the um, the user with the disability or parent would, will always um, self-identify um, whether they think um, the session is, is right for them. And even if you put 300 things on your list, um, it generally won't help with their them self-identifying. And in most cases, um, if you can give them a snippet of information um, and they, they suggested the six or seven um, categories if you could give them the snippet of information to, to show that that class um, would be suitable for someone with visual impairment, visual impairment that, that would give them the information that they need to be able to make the call to then be able to have the discussion um, and their suggestion was in most cases that they would make that call because um, without putting 5,000 things on the list that they're not going to know the detail of what's involved in the class or the session without having a conversation. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I mean, I, what I would, what I'm keen to do is to is to is to um, is to make sure that people can publish and share this information because I think if we don't have something in the spec, there's a risk that these events either won't get published as open data, so they won't be made available, or um, they uh, will be published, but it's not really clear because there'll be lack of information, then people who could take advantage of those sessions won't, because they'll be unsure about the kind of quality of the information. So I, I'm kind of keen on doing an initial version that just focuses on these six or seven categories because of the convergence, regardless of you know what uh, whether that's the right thing to end up with and then as, as Kim suggested do a revision later once we've got more of that data together and it's been tested in, in different systems. I mean this, this is exactly the kind of innovation that, that is supposed to come from from sharing the data. Yeah I mean presumably you can actually make it into a strength and say you know this is a provisional attempt but we're on a base around what the final version is on what happens in the real world and kind of covers, covers that off hopefully. Just yes. to, uh, yeah, just um, you know, one more thing that I would add to it <coughs> um, is, you know, I would say that you know certainly for you know, for a first version we should we should go with the with the seven that have, that that um, that seem to be shared. I would be quite tempted to to uh, to actually extend the list a little bit further if we've got um, you know in your 
you know, in your list that you had there, Lee, there were uh, about four or five other ones which were shared in two or three of the you know, of the data sets. So I would think about having them, you know, there just by default as well. Uh, but what I would certainly really want to see is that the new properties that we add to the schema make it quite clear that these are inclusive disabilities, not just you know, not just extra information on there. So it is uh, clear to to all the to all the API users uh, that um, that where this data is present, it also includes people, you know, you know, with all these, you know, with all these things, uh, rather than leaving it up to them to try and figure it out or to go and find it in a manual somewhere. I would make sure that the actual property names are quite clear. You're on mute, Lee. Sorry, I was agreeing, um, uh, but also saying I think what it would be useful to get some definitions against um, what these mean. Um, you know, what, what do we mean by physical impairment? Um, I don't know whether there are definitions that would exist because that would help with labeling of user interfaces, but also uh, both on the, uh, the setup side when somebody's uh, creating a session, but also downstream people who are using the data. Um, just to, uh, I think that sounds like a really good idea. Um, I, what I wonder in terms of the publishing approach, um, because some, I know GLL for example, doesn't capture any of this data at the moment. Um, and obviously at some point we'll be asking people to think about capturing data they don't currently capture because they will then comply to the standard by capturing additional information. Um, from what it sounds like we're saying, there's a suboptimal approach that we're aware that we might be taking based on the, you know, there's a consensus here, but we, have, we don't really have it fully tested with users, um, albeit that, that, you know, that, that this might be the best, because as you say, it's too complicated to do it any, in any better way. So maybe we'll just use uh, the, you know, the, let them discern themselves and have a good contact point. Um, but I wonder if there should be a kind of clear guidance that says, we're not saying to everyone, go out and capture all this data for your thousands of sessions yet because it's still evolving, um, but actually, you know, allowing people to, if they, if they happen to do it, they can capture data, great. If they can map what they've got to this, then great. Um, and I just wonder whether we should have a, a bit of a process of refinement before we get people to start capturing, sorry, gathering data. See, I'm, I'm still a bit not, I'm a bit unclear. If, we, if we're pushing this out, we just need to be clear on, we have all these categories but fine but how are we is it the session is it the session that offers it or is it the the person leading the session that has those skills and things like that because i think we have to be absolutely clear because otherwise we get some really this is kind of an area that will be you know i'll defer to cal about this but i mean it, it, it's an area that if you get it wrong it's not good basically so it's a kind of sensitive area so if we're not sure about it we, i think we need to kind of we definitely need to have this kind of good practice guide around it Okay, um, I, I, I mean, I, I think from what we've seen so far, we're, we're talking about sessions, not, not the people organizing the sessions. And that seems to be what, you know, looking at the, the, the fields that Jade shared, and I think from understanding Kim's uh, comments that, you know, that's what is being tagged up here, rather than with capturing competencies of individual coaches. Actually, interestingly, um, Lee, our um, system is, is built on the competency of the individual um because the it's the individual that would have the skill sets and abilities to make the classes accessible to those individuals which obviously isn't the same as okay. those sports where the sports have like you know the slope to get in the pool because then it's based on the venue whether the venue has a slope or if there's a a sport where like wheelchair basketball is in inclusive basketball is not uh, so it sounds like that attribute could exist on the sport, also on the venue, also on the individual. Yeah, we have two, um, we have sort of a few different options. We have the, is this class um, suitable for, we use the wording suitable for, which would take in that the, the teacher self, the teacher fills it in. And so, or it could be the, the whatever the organiser fills it in, but the organiser would need to take into consideration the person that's taking that session and the facilities. 
that if, if it's suitable for would take both into consideration and then separately we, we, we data capture um, if whether it's wheelchair accessible. Okay. Um, right. I, th I, I think so. Okay. This, this, we've got loads of loads of notes, and uh, maybe I just need to revise what the proposal is. Uh, I think I'll go. What I'll do is I'll um, try and summarise some of this back to the list with a way forward, and then we can uh, kick it around there. Um, if there's other people that we should be talking to, then. Um, uh, I'm open for suggestions so that we can get some validation. Um, I, I'm, I think I'm just keen that we try and balance keeping, uh, allowing some publication of this data already because it's, it's, it's important to do that without kind of, you know, putting a foot wrong really um, and just kind of holding, um, yeah, not doing anything. Um, uh, okay, Carol, can I, I ask quickly on in terms of EDFS, um, uh, sorry, EFDS, and um, uh, interactive? Do you think either of those are worth including in this conversation in the mailing list or otherwise? Uh, or yeah, I think um, I, I think um, e EFDS would would be useful. I was just going to ask you about user testing and obviously at, at various points where the, whether that's at all possible because. Ultimately, if we can, if we can get um, a group of disabled people to, to come in fresh and, and look at that, that might give an indication of um, how people interact and how they identify and we can get a clear sense of where tweaks can be made, whether it's at this stage or at a later stage. Is that, is that in, as part of the plan? Um, I hadn't considered end user testing, no, because, you know, as a data standard, that what we've, the way that we structure the standard might not reflect the way that um, the data would be presented to users in terms of you know, describing, summarizing events, driving dis discovery interfaces. Um, uh, you're on mute again. Actually, if we're expecting people to present that directly. Yeah, I mean, I think it would just help because it is a quite a complex um, sort of issue. I think maybe it would just help provide some clarification in certain areas where um, we're, we're not sure about sort of, um, either whether some of the definitions or some of the categories and how people could um, identify things from a, um, a consumer perspective. It might help. Yeah, okay. Okay, I'll, I'll have a think about it. I, I... Uh, we do that, and it, we might need, we might need to get some support from from yourself and others uh, to make that, that work. Um, I'm keen to move us on to the to the next topic. Um, uh, but please shout if anyone's got anything else they wanted to. Any last thoughts there? Um, Can you read um, Ray's um, no, notes in the group chat? Uh, Lee, it might just be worth for the for the record of everybody who's uh, watching this call and not seeing group chat. Uh, Ray says, final thing for me, I assume that these classifications will be linked to scores or similar versions, a version list rather than embedded in the spec. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it would be another kind of uh, list, it would be a little vocabulary that we could um, attach some documentation to. Um, and in principle, you know, we can extend that in the same way as we're planning to do for the activity list. Yeah. Um, okay, right. So let's let's move on to the the activity list discussion. Um, share my screen again. Okay. Um, so I just, just, say, just I, don't, I don't think Carol needs to stay on for this bit. Carol, if you want to go. Um, so I just want to quickly recap uh, kind of what, what we've done so far and then um, open it out for discussion. Um, so we, uh, we've agreed to kind of uh, to go ahead and uh, do some initial bootstrapping work to create uh, a shared activity list. So Kim, Becky and Jade have been working on this already. Um, I've shared the draft uh, to the mailing list which we've been discussing today. Um, I've been also working on a kind of editorial guide so that there's some context that goes around the list 
that describes how it's been put together um, and the kind of direction for things like handling revisions and things. Um, before we just kind of look at that, um, I wanted to just kind of summarize some of the use cases, I think, that, I, uh, that have come up around the activity list, just so that we can have these in mind when we're thinking about how to structure it and the kind of detail that goes in there. Um, so what, obviously one of the, the key uses of the list is to support searching. Um, so searching for uh, uh, participants, we're trying to find uh, opportunities, uh, but also just powering search for somebody setting up a, um, a session and just needs to be able to quickly pick uh, from a list of activities to tag up the session. So for that kind of view, you need clear labeling, description, synonyms. Um, the activity list could also be pairing a kind of browse, in, browse interface um, as, a, as another way of doing discovery. So there, there would be a kind of looking at having a kind of clear structure, uh, meaningful labeling in the list, and maybe some relationships. So kind of looking at related activities. Um, but I think there's also some other important requirements are around data integration um, to enable uh, uh, data that's coming from different systems to be brought together uh, in a consistent way. And for there, we, we obviously need a shared list that has got common identifiers and perhaps the ability to extend it um, uh, in particular, um, particular areas particular, for particular types of uh, sport and activity. Um, I think it can also be useful for reporting to so be able to do things like, you know, uh, summarize number of, of activities that are running of a particular type in a particular area. So there we want to be able to have a useful uh, classification, be able to roll up around uh, top terms. And I th my thing is that we, sh we should try and look for a way to kind of balance these different requirements rather than just focusing purely on search or purely on data integration. Um, I, I think the kind of skulls based structure that we've been working around will support that. Um, but obviously we need to think about um, all of these things, you know, around the identifiers, the structure list, the labeling, et cetera. Um, so the, the first steps that have happened so far is um, we agreed to start merging uh, the lists that have been shared to date, um, which is what um, Kim and Becky have been taking a lead on. Um, so hopefully you've all had a chance to have a look um, at that list. I'll just bring it up now. Uh, so it's shared on my screen. Um, uh, so there's been, been some feedback on it already. And um, Kim, I don't know whether you want to maybe just say briefly how you and Becky went through pulling together the list? Uh, yeah, to be honest, we, we literally just did that. We had the different lists and we put them all together. Um, we kind of had a rough structure in, in Sports Suite and then uh, the EMD, um, Jade sent over her list and, uh, and then uh, Nick's also had a sent over one from Sport England. And we, we just pulled them all together really and tried to sort of classify them as, as, as you can see there with the broader term and then the narrower term underneath. Um, where Sports Suite already had these particular activities within our database, we then added the descriptions that we that we have. Again, these aren't, you know, you could, you could debate all day long, you know, what the correct descriptions should be next to them. But this is this was literally just sort of like the one or two liner, so we know what the activity is. Um, so it's kind of more for reference. I'm sure that people that are within of these activities might want to define them or write it differently. But it was it was a start of a ten. Um, so there are pink gaps in there. They're the ones where the when in our system or we didn't have a description on it that still need to be filled in. Um, we're certainly not precious over this layout. I've, I've kind of said in an email before, um, this is definitely a start of a turn and, and up for discussion. So if people have a better way of doing it, um, then by all means, this is the sort of time to sort of say and figure out the best way to do the feedback. The, the one thing to, uh, has also been raised in, in the emails today was about the, the top level terms, you know, the sport and physical activity. Um, <coughs> so uh, particularly in our current sports partnerships and LRA, we, we do split things down by sport and physical activity just because you know we have sport lead and physical activity leads within our office so for our internal reporting it, it was of use that doesn't necessarily mean it, it's a very good indicator of something to be putting on um, for people to publicly search by it because actually from a user's point of view often users don't always know if something's a sport or physical activity and quite frankly sometimes we get it wrong or there's different things you might say that physical activity uh, like walking but actually then you have race walking which is a sport so um, having that as a top level term is uh, probably a, a, a bit of a discussion point personally we wouldn't have had that that's more for behind the scenes when we were pulling off reports 
but um, it's been added on there anyway, so that's probably the, the first port of call, whether anyone thinks it should just be for reference behind the scenes or, or something that um, is actually worth keeping on there. Uh, and then, yeah, then the rest of it, we've just sort of pulled together from the lists that are there. But like I said, it, you know, I'm happy for it to be torn apart and re-put together. It was just a, just a start of a discussion, really. Okay, thanks. And I should, you should say that um, it, it, was, it was me that put the, put the sport and physical activity at the top level. Um, so uh, that's something that I think the feedback we've had so far is that that's not necessarily a useful thing. Um, as Kim's saying, uh, I'm sorry, I'm happily, happily drop that. I think the only reason I, I kind of included that um, was just looking at thinking about it from purely from a kind of uh, data reuse point of view. It might be useful for somebody to be, who's just interested in the list of sports to be able to get those, you know, versus broader physical activities. Um, but if we were to represent those as uh, collections rather than as top terms, then uh, that, that option is still available. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy to happily um, uh, cut out that top term if, if that's the kind of consensus. It's tricky because also some people, um, I mean, almost everything could be classed as a physical activity, you know, and, and conversely, a lot of physical activities could be classed as a sport, you know, people are doing them in a competitive environment, for example. So it just starts getting a little bit wishy-washy and down on, on who does what and what have you say. So, um, maybe just at ease. <laughs> and is, <laughs> is that... Yeah, and is this also a, a, a tagging thing? Maybe that's, rather than it being a top term, if you wanted to tag things as sports, that might be something for tagging rather than the hierarchy? Yeah, yeah, it could be. Um, I mean, we have, uh, is it, I can't remember, the, is it called collections or, um, or something like that? Yeah. I mean, it could come under the, we have actually added collections to this list. I don't know if you can scroll to the right, Lee. Um, on there. So again, these are just the, the collections that, that on sports that we put these into. Uh, people, again, might have different classification or collections, sorry, getting used to your terminology. <laughs> um, so we can, again, change these. These ones, for example, if somebody was wanting and are interested in a ball game, you know, you could do ball games and then pull anything that involved a, a ball in that particular sport or if it was an Olympic sport or a Paralympic sport. So for some of these, we, we have then passed uh, classified them into under relevant collections but as you can see not all of them because not all of them are on our particular system when we've merged them across so again um, and these are also just our collections so you know Sport England or anybody else there has their own sort of classifications uh, and collections sorry we could add them to that list as well um, it could you know we could have a, have a much larger list and then or it could not have any list and leave that down to individuals on their own systems to apply things that suit their organization so it's it's, it's, it's very, very much up for debate, to be honest. It's completely up to you guys. We just thought we'll pull together the information that we have and then um, leave it for this call, really, to discuss further. Yeah, uh, yeah, which, uh, which, is, which is great. Um, I mean, the, the collections are there really just to provide useful sub-lists, you know, uh, that just kind of gloss over uh, the structure of the, the rest of the list. You know, it's just to, you know, you know, using examples you've got here, kind of ball sports or team sports, you know, irrespective of, of whatever might be a kind of natural way to hype, to, to rank those. Um, so, I, I mean, they're, they're useful to include in a standard list if we think people can benefit from them and that it'd be useful to be able to have a common list of team sports and ball games. But if, if that is less useful generally to people, then it might be worth just kind of leaving that out um, and just saying how people can uh, create and share those themselves. Yeah, I think it's going to be on a case by case depending on how people use it. I know we had one client that in particular um, used that information to then to try and do it as in like, oh, are you the kind of, they made like another little tool from it. So instead of you're a kind of person that wants to do sport with other people and then it would then feed through the team stuff, you know, or are you a person that wants to do things on their own and it would feed through the individual stuff. But honestly, it would be on a case by case basis and whoever wants to use that information really. Yeah, okay. Okay, so there's a question around the, the collections. I, I think there's a yeah, I think there's a consensus that we, we remove what it currently got as the top term, which means that what's currently level two becomes the top terms in the hierarchy. Um, I think there were some other uh, suggestions. I think I think maybe this come from Jade that maybe we should just go with a single le single level to begin with. Um, What's, what's everyone's thoughts there? Sorry, it was, it was more of a just uh, making sure um, that, so if we went out with 
to level two and three, um, was putting myself open to a lot of um, initial sort of, ah, that's not right, you didn't consult with me, etc. cetera. Um, so we either do a, a spot of consultation um, before the level threes, or just make sure when it goes out, it goes out with a very clear, um, this is what we've got, we need you to help us. Um, to define your specialist areas. Yeah. Okay. Is there a natural owner for all of the all of the things that are at level that are currently level two? Well, this is the thing. I think that's why some of them we highlighted in yellow. Um, you know, things such as as you can see there is a hand cycling and and to be honest, it's a lot of the uh, hybrid sports. We were a bit like, well, what do they go under? <laughs> Does is it a hybrid sport in its own right? It's at the top level, or is it you know, is cheerleading under gymnastics, for example, or you know, is abseiling a sport in its in its own right, or is it under climbing? Or, so you know, there are these sort of elements where it's a it's a bit trickier to know if they go under something or not. And so we kind of highlighted them yellow and was like, ah, we'll let everybody else debate that. <laughs> it could be that it, you know, if it's Sport England recognized and it was on the top level, that could be one way of, of determining it. Um, or like you said, not to have the levels. Um, for, for us, the reason that we've had the two levels though is because as you can see, this list is, is really long, especially when you include the EM D classes, you know, because there's lots of different versions of classes, um, which is brilliant. But obviously, when this rolls out and then you get more and more classes and more and more information being added, it, it, it could become very long for users to be scrolling through um, either when they're searching or when adding something, you know, when you're trying to find your class. Um, so we kind of had a top level just to sort of shorten it down in the first instance, and then you can then, you know, look at your strength and conditioning and then you can see the different sessions underneath that, for example. Um, but that was more from how we chose to display it. If it's kept as like, you know, just two levels and then, you know, some people might decide to do an open text and it'll search across both levels uh, or if they just search the top level and then it opens up the second level. But I think that's down to display um, that, that individual organization chooses to do. I still think having it in the two levels makes it easier manage but that's just like I say my opinion you know football was for example the level to the broader term as like it's on this list here and then they then said all the different versions underneath that then you say you know hand it over to them to make that call uh, how they'd like their sport laid out but it is a tricky one um and I don't think there's much of a right answer I think we should give it a majority on it I think yeah I mean I, I agree with the two levels um so the what's currently the level two and the level three um, I was just saying in terms of the level three, we just need to be really careful of our communication um, um, and I think actually for a lot of the sports there are owners and, and Sport England, um, Nick might be able to um, comment or suggest on that, um, for example gymnastics, we want to ask gymnastics to be correct and the same for angling, same for base, base and softball, etc. I was just going to say, one of the interesting things about the list is that because we, I think it's defining if you've got the top level and when what is the secondary level, is what exactly should go in the secondary level. Because when we start to look at it, and you know, sporting is bad for this as well, we've kind of got, we've now got a kind of mixture of formats, there's some facilities in there, there's some disciplines. It, it's a whole different kind of list. And, it, you know, so, you know, if you take football, for example, you would say, got um, five aside, you know, you've got the, seven aside, etc. That's almost like the, the the format of the game rather than a kind of secondary style of football or things like that. Because um, in a way, you know, you've got small sided in there, which is a kind of, that, that basically encompasses, you know, a the seven aside and five aside game. And then in golf, you've got, you've got at the moment, we've got things like... Uh, driving range was almost like a facility so we kind of it's almost a question if, if looking at the second level what exactly do we say should be included there not included in there I, um, Nick I completely agree with what you put in your feedback um, earlier in the week in terms of we need to look at it from a consumer perspective I think if we just look at it from a recognized sport perspective and um, we're gonna miss a trick in some cases in terms of what consumers will be looking for. So we kind of need to come to a, a sensible agreement probably with those sports as well in terms of 
what would be the define what would be defined at level two and level three? Yeah, that's um, interesting. Well, because I was just going to say all that. You're right. Because if you looked at, if to me, I looked at it, say five football, and look at the search terms, you'll find if you go through Google, there'll be loads of searching five side football. But when you look at this as a list, if it's supposed to be to also used for a back end system to hold that, the, the private side element effectively wouldn't necessarily be sitting in the same field as this kind of. I don't know, the list we've got here, if that makes sense, in that secondary thing, it would be sitting somewhere else. So this is what I'm just kind of trying to understand what that secondary list is. But you're right, in terms of the terminology and search terms have to be kind of as relevant as possible to get back to the consumer. Yeah. So related to that, there's the kind of, you know, the, the trademarks um, things. So the kind of Zumba, some of the Les Mills stuff, should those be on the list? Because we had some discussion before about whether those should be included. Yeah. Or not. I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd say yes. So I'll be honest, that's, that's my world, so it's more likely to say yes than anyone. But from a consumer's perspective, someone I'm searching for those things. So they're, they're not going to search for, say, so Zumba's Latin. So a, a user wouldn't know that Zumba was Latin, they'd be looking for Zumba. Let me know conditioning or something but they'll, they'll search body pump. I would agree with Jade that the trademark ones that are kind of trademark and they're out there and basically you have to have a license to, to put on that probably should be in that list I think what we were trying to avoid with the kind of the other category in the data model was where you know uh, operators were coming up with their own kind of wacky names or letting loose let someone was getting let loose in the center and reinventing the same thing and that's what we were trying to avoid and have that that would come as a standard category but then they could they, they would link it back to you know, whatever they call their spinning class would be um you know linked back to spinning as an actual definition yeah okay well that's that's a good test you know if it's got you know, if, it's, if it's trademark or registered in some form then it's suitable for going on the list otherwise it's not got a um, it, that's a useful test of awareness if people start to is protecting it. Um, it's not the only test, obviously, but it's a kind of useful indicator. Um, so I'm the, well, I was going to say on, on the on the do we publish two or three list uh, question from earlier? Should we just stick with level two and not worry about publishing level three? Um, from a data user perspective, I suggest that publishing more might be better than publishing less because I think there's a definite hunger for this kind of stuff and um even if we don't use it or we put guidance around it to say it's draft or whatever um having it there so that people can choose to to, to use it and and then feedback on it i would suggest would be preferable uh, and then let them decide whether it's you know something that they, they want to do yeah yeah i don't know. i think that makes sense to me as well um yeah i mean for me for me use point of view um, if somebody just wants to power this as a search, they can um, index across them and not show the hierarchy, but it would be nice to have some structure to be able to power kind of more kind of browsing and kind of faceted interfaces. Um, so what I was thinking about is in terms of next steps, um, uh, my suggestion was going to be to, um, so if we move the top term for now, so that we just focus on two levels, um, and we you collaborate around this spreadsheet. I can open it up for uh, public suggestions so that we've got one place that we can um, put in uh, more detailed feedback. Um, and if we just focus on the, the, the top two terms and just ignore collections for the moment, so that we're just identifying those top two levels of the hierarchy, synonymism description, as a way just to scope the, getting us to a an initial release that we could then take out um, to NGBs or whoever else we need to get involved to get them to sanity check bits of the hierarchy that they're more responsible for or more familiar with. Can I ask them when, when we send this out, are we able to um, put some coding against these terms or are the terms in themselves? Uh, what I'm thinking in practical terms is if people start using this list uh, in their systems, 
and then we change the, the list. Um, obviously, there's a version control around that, but just to allow people to start using it immediately if they want to, um, I don't understand Raymond's point from previously. It'll probably be every six months it gets integrated in some of the bigger systems. Some of the small systems don't want to use it right away. Um, is there something that, let's say, that we decide that sea fishing, when the fishing speci for specialists come back, is actually called something else that's not sea fishing and there's extra characters in there? Um, how are we going to make sure that we don't have load of data, or do we do we just have migrations like we said before between the versions that we? Also, yeah. So there's a so not filled in. There's a the first column on the spreadsheet is an ID, a unique ID column, um, to it so that we can have a stable reference to the terms even if the primary labels alter. Um, so I would I, I think we would I wasn't going to worry about kind of populating those now because so we've got it's just one less thing to worry about as we're doing some internal organization but the point we put it out for public con uh, comment we have a unique id for everything um you know if, if you want to if you want to start using the list now then it's kind of buyer beware whilst we're in early draft um, but it would just be a um just a stable kind of uh, stable id that we can assign rather than relying on the labels so if the idea will have like a and I, once it's published, it's a very sort of open, we're, we're in consultation period um, for the next oh, however many weeks, months, whatever. Um, tell us now or forever hold your peace type thing. Yeah, I think if we, if we can like take, take a lead on just getting something reasonably polished that we think is kind of coherent with some guidance around uh, how we've done it. Uh, and then put it out for a, a wider review, you know, put it, push it out to as many people in the sector, as many uh, bodies that uh, should have input as possible. Um, give them a, a period for feedback and then um, incorporate that and then we, then we can kind of draw a line under, you know, activity list 1.0. I was just wondering, um, sorry, from um, Nick Spring, Nick, is, there, is, it, is it worth, worth like, so we don't get every man in his dog type approach? Like, is there any, um, do you think there's any benefit in going to each of the entities and, and getting someone to take ownership of looking at their bit of the list? We could, we could notify the NGBs and, and get someone on the NGBs or speak to someone in the NGB team to look at it. But I think we need to kind of ask some very clear questions of what we're kind of asking them to do. To have a look at it and you know because again what what are they expecting in that second in a second list and that's why we're asking these questions around the format and other bits that sit to it next to it because otherwise we'll get a whole load of stuff that sits around it and then we'll have to sift through that so i think we just need to kind of ask for going out to them, which we, we we could do push it out to them it's very clear about what we're looking to get back so they get because we're I mean, we're immersed in it, talking about this all the time but we give it out to them coming it may not really understand what we're doing and it might be it might be something that we could test actually through the odi work we're doing with some of the ngbs already so whether engaged with some of the ngbs what we could do is to start to, to get them to have a look at it as well as a kind of more hands-on so you could go out with a wider scattergun type approach but also then with some of these kind of gps we're working with to release their data at the moment say so does this kind of make sense Yeah, I think, I think that's a good idea. I think being able to test it with a few first, because it will give us uh, feedback on our own guidance on in terms of what um, what kind of feedback we want to get from people. Um, but if there's a few areas where we know that we've, we're probably uh, weak on in terms of representation, it would be useful to, to get them involved at this stage. I think, Jay, do you think you'd said that um, engaging it um oh yeah um I'll, ha I'll happily show this um i've already started speaking to you characters because i think that's one of the areas um there's no nothing or anything like that in there at the moment um, it'd be really good to get their buy-in anyway so um yeah. i'll i'll share with them okay. um just one, one more question comment from me um the the case sensitivity of the data so level two level three well at the moment they're all upper case um, when you're implementing this in an application, obviously, if you want to display this to the user, you probably wouldn't want to use uppercase. Um, is there a reason why we're sticking with uppercase? Um, I guess what I'm thinking is it's easier to convert from uh, uh, 
just sentence case or whatever case that the, the trademarks are in, because obviously trademarks specifically might have their own preferred case for some of the, the styling. Um, to uppercase, if you want us to go to uppercase, you're almost losing information by capturing it all in uppercase because that way the styling of the trademarks and other sports where there's hyphens and you're not sure um, might not be obvious. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I agree. I think I think they, they should be display labels, um, so we can. Um, yeah, we, we can we can change that. Um, there probably needs to be just a few, you know, editorial things around. You know, uh, do we always use ampersand or and just so that there's some style guide for for labeling things so that it'll help when we add new things. Um, we could also add any variations under synonyms. Um. Um, okay. So um, just a just a couple of points for me. Um, I think uh, I think I broadly do uh, see the point that long term we need to have both level two and level three. Um, I guess in the short term, I am quite concerned about how long it is going to take us to settle on what the values would be uh, in level three, especially if we're going to be pushing this out to other third parties for them to fill in their own values. Um, we are not really going to have uh, any way of ensuring that they get done by a certain uh, date and time for that. Uh, I would almost be tempted to say, um, because we want people to start using this and to actually uh, prove it, I would be tempted to say that version 1.0 uh, should just be the level two, which we can pretty much publish as it is now, uh, based on the list that we've got there, and then move quite quickly into a, we've got a version 1.1 beta, uh, uh, sorry, draft out there, which has got the further level three categorization within it. Is there a way we could, um, lay, we, we could version the different levels? So version level two is in alpha or beta, level three is in alpha or do you know what I mean? So public publishing it. So users that wanted to use it all could, uh, if they're a bit more kind of quicker to, yeah, just smaller, I'm thinking. Um, but then as you say, not, uh, yeah, put the health warning on it so that it's there. Um, but, but, but they don't, they don't use it and break it. So, I, I, I think, sorry, Raymond, I was going to say the other issue I think we have with this. I mean, I agree with you. If you if you want to go, okay, push something out because of the big list, but there might be something that we need to do rough and ready around this because <clears throat> when you look at some of the sports on there, so you take all the stuff that Jay's putting as, as, as the, all the stuff around uh, the movement dance stuff, dance stuff, cardiovascular classes don't make any sense it wouldn't make any sense to an operator inputting that because it will be all around aerobics body step body tack so there's a lot of stuff that's actually in i would say part of the, the lower sessions too that should actually if you're going to push it out to do it usable would have to move across into from sorry level three into level two Sorry, can I just ask, why won't we just push it out as it is? Just throwing it out there. Uh, I mean, as it is today. Um, just, I'm I just wondering, if you need someone to test it, you know, I mean, we're saying, well, let's get all the NGBs to consult it, let's get all this to consult it. Like someone just said, it, it's just going to keep adding more and more time to it. And uh, I don't know if there is like a... I almost need a little date where when's a cutoff point that sort of says, you know, let's do as much as we can, but on this date, we're going to roll out with a beta. Because to be honest, we've been chatting about this since November. Um, and I know when I spoke to, to uh, Nick from ADI and I said, look, we just need to really sort of think of a date. I don't care what the date is, whether it's in six months' time or six weeks' time or six days' time, but if we can have a date that we work to and then we, we um, just to do a beta one, not to roll out to everybody, but just to do a couple of test ones. Just we get something actionable going because that's when because we keep saying we're doing the consultation but we kind of need to have a test working in order to have that that um you know to be able to get that insight otherwise i'm not sure where we're going to get the insight from or are we trying to do a final product and then we roll it out in six months time when um when it's all there and it's all set i mean it's just it's just sort of putting a, a date in if we have one 
But I think I think Kim, that's what what Roman's kind of saying. So him as a him as an operator who's pushing this into a live system, that he he if he if he's spending you know they're burning resources on this, so they need to get to a position which is which one that kind of makes it's easily manageable for them to implement into the into the into their system into cloud live systems. So I suppose he's looking at it and thinking, well, if I'm going to test it, I want to make sure it kind of into the position where it's near to near to the end without a lot of uncertainty and not necessarily a massive kind of list or something like that. I, I well, think, I, um, I, oh. you know, I was, you know, I was really looking at more from the, you know, more from the, uh, uh, from the point of view of risk mitigation. I think uh, the more people that you try to have uh, uh, actually, actually have, have have valid input into it upfront. The longer something's going to take, um, and you know that's just the way things tend to be. Um, so, you know, um, I I would be you know I'd be fine if we were to just turn around and say, well, this is what we're going with. You know, for now, this is our first draft, et cetera, et cetera, and we version it and then we move on, kind of thing. Um, my big fear is I know in some of the some of the level two terms that we've got that uh, you know like for example cardiovascular and also dance areas there is there is pretty much constant changes and tweaking you know to the names that people are using there it is a very it is a very competitive market so there's always new brands appearing etc cetera, etc cetera. so we are never going to get to a finished list as it were so you know rather than trying to get to that finished list let's just accept the fact up front that it's never going to be complete and let's just rule a line and say, well, that's what we're going to do for now. So we can at least get it out there so people can start using it and we can start getting that valuable feedback as to what's working, what's not working, and then let that steer us as opposed to us trying to get it perfect first time. Yeah. I, um, so, so to try and kind of uh, summarize those points, I, I just think there's generally we're, we're in agreement and I think it's just about the process of doing the, the engagement and the revision. So I think everyone's keen on doing an iterative approach. I think everyone's keen on just getting something out initially. It's just uh, how much um, effort we want to put into that first version, whether we just go pretty much with what we have um, uh, or whether we want to just spend a bit more time on um, filling in any known weak areas. Um, the, 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 uh, I think the, the important thing is that when whatever state we do put uh, something out for comment is that there should be clear feedback channels. So if people have got issues or questions, they know where to come to. Uh, and also that they're clear on what the revision process is. So there's just a bit here about how we manage people's expectations. So they know that this isn't something that is being forced on the sector, that we've got a kind of clear plan um, and that there are, there are times within which they can kind of engage with that process. So as long as we're setting people's expectations around when and where they can feedback and then uh, at what point the list is going to be um, reissued with any further updates, then that might just help manage people's uh, potential concerns. Yeah, I agree. I think that would really help. Um, and I also think it would be really good because I think when you said about the, the weaker areas, I think it's probably... For me, my lack of knowledge is, is, is the dance sort of classes, so the stuff that... Um, the EMD and then the ledger operators are on about, about the, the different kind of classes that keep coming out all the time. Um, wasn't aware of quite how often they are, but yeah, actually thinking about it, I'm thinking at my own gym and there is always like another range of stuff that's coming out all the time. So um, it might be good um, if those guys can determine what would be the best terms, the narrower, or broader terms to, to cover the darn stuff so that, you know, if new iterations come out of those versions, they can still sit under them on later levels comfortably or they can be added on nicely as we go further along but sport wise um that's probably the one that will be a little bit quicker in my opinion to be able to set i mean there's probably obviously a few sports that we might need to have a bit of, of chatting with uh, some sports just to firm up and determine but essentially unless anybody else has other comments i don't think it'll be too far off where we're at to be perfectly honest um, um 
you know, I think it's probably more the, it is probably more the exercise side of it and how to classify those. And then a few of the more niche or hybrid sports that probably need a bit of determining around them and a bit of description around them. Um, so based on that, I don't know if there's, if there's any way that we could maybe speak or have some volunteers that might be able to look into, you know, actioning and, and supporting those elements to try and get at list a, a bit more um, to a finalized bit. Maybe then we could follow up on the next phone call in a couple of weeks and then hopefully from there at least start having a, pulling together a rough date that we could roll out the first one. So at least we've got something to be working towards. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I think that, that's a great idea. Um, so uh, I was hoping to use the next call in two weeks to kind of do an, uh, another review, a more detailed review of this list. So that gives us uh, maybe the next two weeks to try and um, identify and start filling in any known weak areas. So if we can get kind of some feedback from UK Active, Jade, um, it would be useful if, if everyone could just look at that, what is currently level two in there, and just want to think about whether there are underrepresented areas um, that we need to think about. Um, uh, and then, um, yeah, there's a few other kind of tasks we do to kind of start to try and fill in some of the descriptions, synonyms, that kind of thing. Um, but I'd be keen to kind of move forward quite quite quickly because the, the sooner we get this out for people to test, the better. I was just going to say, in terms of all of the um, group exercise, I know everyone's saying you know fit and stuff is with hundreds and thousands, and um, in at respect and like irrespective of of this group. And um, one of the things that we do as an organisation is to keep that up to date list. And um, so we're going to be able to help um, massively in terms of that because we'll, we'll be doing that anyway. Um, and we, we, we base that as as um, Nick for England said, um, not on someone comes up with a new idea and they're going to call thin something else in the census, but but on volume and demand. So if something sort of meets a threshold, we would put it on to on, onto our list so we can keep that side of things up to date and I, I'll talk to UK um, Active about the, the gym side of things so that should sort of bring together a good, um, a good balance between getting all of the fitness stuff um, covered. Okay that would be great yeah I, I mean I think having people who are willing to kind of own sections of the sections of the list would be a great way to make sure that we're keeping that um, keeping that up to date um, and give us some also some contact points for people to, to provide feedback. I know I said this before, but I'm oh, sorry. No, go I, was, I was gonna say, I know I said this before uh, on the previous call, but it would be great, uh, I, I wonder, for some smaller booking systems to be able to do this a bit more real time. Um, so, for example, when Jade adds a new type of Zumba, whatever uh type of thing uh that that would then come through to those uh drop down that the you know the, the booking system's using to the populate for the activity prize but in, assuming we're only making additive changes and the changes we're making to the existing terms of are based on the ids that are there as we said so the ids can be used to store in the database um really what we're doing is changing the display values and adding on new available options um and so for for some systems uh, it would be feasible uh, and, and certainly I'd be interested in seeing um, some, you know, using this list as almost like a, a fairly live uh, list rather than, you know, uh, on, a, on a massive cycle of, of changes. I totally understand that there's some use cases where there will be that cycle and it will be every six months or whatever. And some systems are installed and don't get, you know, upgraded that frequently or whatever. Um, but then for those that are cloud-based, I'm thinking of book when, mind, body, uh, et cetera. Um, that, that are live in real time. Um, there's, there's no reason in theory why this couldn't just be a, you know, a drop down that uh, they supply, which might mitigate some of the issue around um, frequency of the changes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, I, th I think separately is, we might want to think about the infrastructure for this. I think a, a spreadsheet is probably a is good enough starting point for people to focus on now but um there are you know for example, there are some tools for managing this type of um, taxonomy and thesaurus that, that can do more kind of collaborative editing it may be that that's what we should move this to in the future um and that might help address some of those kind of requirements so that we can do uh you know proposed edits and changes so we can see um 
you know, see potential additions or future additions before they're kind of part of a um, versioned release. But I think that's, that's something I can I can take away and um, I think about to see what uh, what might be the right option for us. Um, I'm mindful of the time we've kind of gone quite quite a bit over today, um, so I'm going to suggest that we probably wrap up the call at this point. Um, I've got quite a lot uh, to go away and write up uh, on both of today's topics, um, and I'll summarise probably in separate emails uh, the way forward for each of these. Uh, two areas so that we can try and push them forward in, in parallel. Um, just before we kind of close out the call, was there anything else that anyone wanted to, to raise today? Just looking across the faces. Um, no? Um, sorry, I should probably just mention uh, to those that aren't already aware, I'm actually going to be leaving Leicester and Rutland Sport. Um, I've got another month to go and so my colleague Becky has been sitting in on the last couple of calls and she helped put this list together and she'll be replacing me going forward so she'll be involved with that going forward so but yeah so that's why I'll, I'll hopefully come in on the one in, in a couple of weeks so I'll see where we're getting to and if we can get the list all going that'd be awesome so we can get it all cracking um because I will still be involved in sports we I'm just moving to uh to the company that's actually built it <laughs> so I'll be moving to Cuttlefish Multimedia uh, and not with the CSP anymore. So um, I'll still have a, a hand in it, but not on the uh, the planning side of it. That'll be the LRS sort of driving side of it. So my colleague Becky will be here instead. Okay, great. Well, uh, congratulations on the job. Uh, thank you for the contributions and welcome, Becky. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so I, I think um, I, I think I'll no, I'll wrap. Up the call. Uh, for those of you watching on YouTube, as usual, uh, um, please, uh, if you've got any feedback, then uh, uh, mail into the, the standards mailing list to, to kind of provide your voice. Um, and I'll see you all in a couple of weeks. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for all your contributions. All right. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Thanks.